We're going to begin with a, um, a few minutes of review, and then we're going to get into an extension of where this goes, because we know roughly what these are. Roughly, in very basic terms, but we want to see where we can extend this. So, uh, you will need your ruler there. If you have a template, it will be enormously useful to you this morning. I'm actually going to make a point about that shortly. But first, let's remember what we already know, just the basics about these guys and what they look like, okay? So we're gonna go through each function, inverse function, uh, its domain and range, and just the brief picture, okay? The reason why we're gonna do this to start with is because we're gonna look at transformations this morning, like what happens when you move things around and you stretch them out and you turn them backwards, etc. But obviously, you've gotta know the basics really well, the fundamentals before you know, okay, what happens when I turn them around and move them, etc. okay? So, come in. Where should we begin? Suggestions? Sine. Okay, let's go with sine inverse of x. Or inverse sine x if you prefer. So you remember to turn y equals sine x into y equals sine inverse of x, we said you'd better restrict the domain, which leads to a restriction on the range for this guy, right? Do you remember that? So we've got a domain and a range. What was the domain that we restricted on the original function? How far do we go? Minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. So that's going to become our range restriction over here. Minus pi on 2 for y, because this is a range restriction now. Come in. 2 pi on 2. Very good. Take a seat. The domain restriction comes from, well, it's something that was innate to the trigonometric functions before, right? Namely the amplitude. So before the amplitude was negative 1 to 1. So now that's our domain restriction, right? So negative one to one. Happy times, okay? Very simply, therefore, what does our graph look like? Good morning, come here. And this one doesn't have to be big or beautiful. Uh, we're just trying to revise in our minds what this looks like. This is gonna be an odd function. Your, um, all your domain and range and the function itself, everything is nice and symmetrical. So just like the original sine function, which in this domain, right, was an increasing function, you remember the inverse of an increasing function is also going to be an increasing function. So that's why we're coming up from here to here. Do you remember that? Okay. Now previously we had like horizontal stationary points, oh sorry, horizontal tangents, if that's the only kind of turning point there are, but this time our tangents will be vertical, right? So if, you, if I were you and I did not have a template to draw this perfectly, I would start by having my endpoints there, good morning, and drawing these vertical lines because that will immediately stop you from drawing the ends of these incorrectly so that you don't quite match the gradient you're supposed to get to. Once you've got those vertical lines there, you just want to draw nice and slowly so you get a nice gradient right there at the origin. Okay, so I'm going to try and do my best here. There we go. I'm happy with that. This is not meant to be um, big or pristine or beautiful, but since we have standard, we might as well put on all the domain and range for this. So I'm going from here to here. That's negative one to one. And here's my range, which is negative pi on two to pi on two. If you want to be really fancy, you can put the dotted lines and so on. But I think we're good. Do make sure, by the way, that these, uh, this graph actually ends at negative one and one. It actually gets there. So do include the, um, the filled circles at the end and don't just end it on a, the line just stops and then nothing happens. Right, let's have a look at sine inverse's brother then, which is oh. cos inverse. Domain and range are going to be very, very similar, right? But slightly different. So start with domain. What's the domain good morning, of inverse cos? It's the same, right? <clears throat> because again, this restriction came from the amplitude, amplitude of the original trig functions. But we noticed because of the shift that's different between sine and cos, we came up with a different range restriction for inverse cos. Do you remember what it was? We go from zero all the way up to pi. Good morning. 
Okay, zero up to pi. So again, yeah, let's draw a picture, and because we've already got this range of fiction, we know which part of the graph we need to draw. We don't need all four quadrants. In this instance, we're going to get something like this. Okay, again, my advice, start with your endpoints and draw your, um, your vertical sort of tangenty bits first, because that will help you get the rest of the shape accurate. I'm going to place one of my endpoints here, one of my endpoints Mm, about there. Okay. One of the ways you can remember, if you do this in order, you'll be able to remember, okay, I've got an increasing function for sine, sine inverse. In the same domain that I restricted before, cos is starting from 1 and it comes down to negative 1. So it's a decreasing function in that domain, which means that its inverse is also going to be decreasing, right? So it's one of the ways you can remember which one is which. Uh, I need to put that Midpoint in there. By the way, what is that y-intercept? We know what that y-intercept is. It's pi on 2. Okay. So it, need, it does need to be halfway. That's one of the things that we'll be looking for, for shape and scale. And once you've got that, you've got all the three points that are the important ones you want to line up through. There are my vertical bits. There we go. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. Again, we should put on our um, labels for these guys, which are important. Beautiful. Okay. Last one. And I am going to be a little bit naughty and try and stick it right underneath. When we go for tan inverse, y equals tan inverse, domain, and range. Okay. The domain of tan inverse comes from the range of tan. How far does tan go up and down? It goes all the way, right? It goes all the way. We had all real values of y before, so now that we've swapped everything around, I'm going to have all real values of x. Come in. Good morning. All your values of x. Now, the range restriction is very similar to sine, is it, with one crucial difference. What's the difference? It is not equal. Yeah, good. I've got, I've got asymptotes here, so I can't actually get to those endpoints. So it's exactly the same without the boundary values. I'm going to go from negative pi on 2, not inclusive, to pi on 2. Okay, I hope you've got a little more space left on your page than I have on mine. We're going to draw our set of axes here. And like we just pointed out, we've got those asymptotes that are horizontal now instead of vertical. Okay, they're at negative pi on 2 and pi on 2. Let's put those guys in. Okay, now. I'm going to have, I mean, if, when you think about the concavity switching around, it's going to be horizontal over here. It's going to slice through at the origin. At what angle am I aiming for, roughly? I want to go for that 45 degrees, or I should say, pi of 4, right? And I want to make sure it's nice and symmetrical. Because, of course, the original function, tan x, is an odd function. So, therefore, its inverse in this restriction is also an odd function. Okay, now... I'm almost done on this last graph. Just like over here and here, I put on my label so I know exactly where this thing exists. I almost know exactly where this thing exists. Almost. I know how far up and down it goes. But at the moment, I can't tell whether this is tan inverse of x or, you know what, it could be tan inverse of 2x or tan inverse of 3x or tan inverse of x over 100. They all look like this. So how will I be able to tell which one it is? I need a... I need a point for scale, right? Perfect. So, what's a nice, easy point for scale for tan? What would you suggest? Yeah, pi on 4. Now, pi on 4 is extra useful because I've already got pi on 2 right there. So, pi on 4 should be exactly halfway. Does that make sense? And again, that's something I should be able to measure and look at by eye. We're really good at halving things, right? So, if I call that one pi on 4, that should be 1. Okay. Happy times. I'm done. Those are all of the basics.